actually, I'm from Oliver. So this is a real honor for me to be here, and I'm super excited about this center being here, and I'm deeply honored to have been invited to come, and just want to say hi to everybody watching online. So today, wow, like totally overwhelming, amazing talks about all the things about sustainability, all the different angles, and it is such an incredibly complex topic. And one thing I always ask people is, how will we know what it looks like when we get there? What does it actually mean? We're all struggling with this concept because it is literally everything, like everything. So what I want to talk to you today about is how to be strategic about sustainability. What does it mean? How do we get there? And sometimes the hardest part is just finding a starting point. So I wanted to start point this way. <laughs> I wanted to start to tell you about my starting point as a starting point for my talk. Um, I'm a sustainability advisor, I do work in Vancouver, um, but I started life as a geologist, and that is me in the field in Nunavut. I worked in a gold exploration property, um, this is the camp that I worked in, obviously this is about in the winter, March, April. Um, it was a fly-in, fly-out camp on a very remote area in Nunavut um, called Goose Lake, and you could only access it by airplane, there was no roads. Fly in, fly out. There was about 36 of us that lived full time in this camp and talk about fishbowl, like big experience in my life. Um, my cabin is just off the picture, um, but that little green hut right in the middle uh, with the green roof on it is where I spent most of my time logging what's above it, which is drill core. So I was working with a team of a geologist to define this deposit, like how much gold was in the ground, what did it look like, where would we have to drill next, and I spent a lot of time logging thousands and thousands and thousands of meters of this core. So you have to be a little bit crazy, I think, or have a very good sense of humor to do this work and stay sane, and whether you think I'm one or the other, we'll let you decide later. <laughs> but um, this was a very transformational experience for me and was my starting point on my sustainability journey. So one day I was taking a break, it was in the fall, I was standing on the porch of this core shack having a cup of tea and taking a break from all the core and I looked down at my cup of tea and when I looked up, this is what I saw. So this is fall in the Arctic, this is in August. Um, the picture does not do it justice, it's this brilliant reds and oranges and yellows as the tundra changes color. As you can see, there's no trees, a uh, very different landscape. And this is the caribou buck that I saw, and he literally wandered into my frame of view. I don't even really know where he came from. And we had this moment, because nobody was around, everyone was on break, the generator was actually off, so it was quiet. Remember you hear that white noise all the time? So it was off, and I was like, wow, look at this guy. He's just standing here, staring at me, and we had this moment, and looking how beautiful he is, and then I realized exactly where he's standing was probably where the beginning of the open pit mine was going to go. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> I don't really think that I want to uh, contribute my time and energy and skills this way anymore, um, contributing to putting a mine there, because I didn't know and I had no control over how it would go in, all of that stuff. And that was what I call my caribou aha moment. And so I think a lot of us in the sustainability industry and those of us that have a personal interest in it may also have these um, aha moments to share. Some of you have actually shared beautiful epiphanies today too. And that's great for us, but what about the rest of the population? I think we're really struggling to get our heads around what the heck does this actually mean? And I think when we talk about sustainability, this is what comes to mind for a lot of people. It's, is it rape if the tree doesn't want to be hugged? <laughs> I found this as a poster in Amsterdam for Boom Chicago. It's a comedy um, show. So I think this is what a lot of people come and bring to mind, and we kind of all know what the negative connotations of being called a tree hugger are. But I really believe that sustainability has progressed much further beyond this. And over the last 20 years, it's been studied and envisioned and We've looked at so many different angles. We've looked at the toxicity, we've looked at biological systems, chemistry, life cycle analysis, the loss of languages. We're in this place where we have a lot. I'm going to go to the next slide. We have a lot of detail that we're dealing with. We're talking about climate change, 
farming, food, pesticides, and then the whole social side of things as well, poverty, health systems, obesity. Um, we're really dealing with a lot of details. And I think one of the biggest challenges right now in the whole green movement, if we can call it that, is sometimes we get into this all or nothing energy. So we get into the place where we're like completely overwhelmed and we're like, holy crap, I can't fix anything, so I'm not gonna do anything. And this is a really challenging place to be. So keeping with the tree metaphor, I'd like to use this to frame the rest of my conversation about how to be strategic. So when we're talking about on the family and individual level, we're talking about things that are in the leaves, and we refer to these as the details. So for us, on a personal level, that might be um, we're thinking about heating and cooling our houses. How do we get around? What's our personal transport choices? What kind of food are we bringing into the house? Um, you know, if I buy this, is it bad? If I do that, is it bad? So we get into this crazy situation sometimes where we get lost in the leaves and we get paralyzed and we think, oh gosh, you know, if I do that, is it bad? Is this choice bad? Is that choice better? And I have a very dear friend and mentor who refers to this as picking between plague or cholera. <laughs> and it's also commonly referred to as trade-offs in the sustainability language. And it's a place that we really, I believe, we can avoid. And are we gonna work? Radio waves. So sometimes it's harder to keep a big picture perspective on things. And this is the sort of sense of humor I was telling you about before. These are some colleagues of mine uh, in the northern part of British Columbia, and this is all drill core. <laughs> Help us. I love this photo because it reminds me all the time that, you know what, the planet, actually, this might be controversial for me to say this, it's gonna be just fine. It's been around for 4.5 billion years. It's gonna be fine. We're the ones that need help. We're destroying the system that we depend on for our very survival. And so with the rest of this conversation, I wanna bring us down out of the leaves and give us something to ground to. I would like to talk to you about ground rules because from a fundamental perspective, we're actually doing only a few things wrong to break the planet, basically. And so if we can bring ourselves out of those details, out of those leaves, and get away from the trade-offs and the plague or cholera decisions, and we can pass all of our decisions through these four ground rules for sustainability, we're going to have a much better chance at creating a sustainable society. And they are great because what I'm going to share with you is all the things we're doing wrong, the only four things. This is how we're being unsustainable, what, we were what you were mentioning before earlier today. If we understand how we're being unsustainable, it's beautiful because it gives us this ability to say, wow, okay, that's what I shouldn't be doing. Now I know what it looks like to be unsustainable, and I can flip those on their head and say, well, if I'm not doing any of those things, guess what? I'm moving in the right direction towards being sustainable and creating a sustainable society. So what are these things? These are the four root causes of unsustainability. What are we doing? We're digging stuff up out of the ground faster than the earth can replace it. So we're digging up fossil fuels, burning them. We're digging up things like uranium. We're using that for energy. We are digging up materials like metals and using those in electronics, for example, that go obsolete within less than a year with the new iPad coming out. It's a perfect example. And we just throw them away. We have very poor systems for capturing these things in tighter loops. And metals are one thing we don't want to lose because they're beautiful, they're elements. Second thing we're doing, we're poisoning our system. Did you know that we create 75,000 to 100,000 different types of man-made chemicals? Many of them are not tested on how they interact with each other. We put them in our personal care products. We slather them all over our body's largest and most absorptive organ, our skin. We spray them on our food. And we put them in pretty much everything that we bring into our house in the furniture, carpets, and so on. Clothing, kids' toys. The third thing that we're doing, we manipulate and destroy nature for profit. We've done this by creating ge genetically modified terminator seeds, which has hijacked a 2,000-year-old uh, tradition of seed husbandry. We pave over wetlands to create strip malls and gated housing communities. We, uh, and we like to chop down the rainforest to create palm oil and uh, beef, 
plantations, for example. And the fourth thing that we're doing is we create barriers in the way so that people cannot meet their needs. And this acts like a gas pedal, incidentally, on everything else in the world. If you can't meet your basic human needs, you're not really going to care about saving the planet, right? So these are the only the four things, four things we're doing wrong. So now the challenge becomes, how do you take these four things and connect them to all of the details that are up in the leaves of that tree? You can use this as a filter to pass all your information through, and what's missing is that middle part, and that's where the strategies come in. So on top of, thank you, on top of um, reuse, recycle, reduce, the other ones that I like to talk about are substitute, or avoid, or use the precautionary principle. I'd like to share with you three more details, but I think what you should first do is hug a tree. <laughs> this is me in Spain, hugging a tree in apparently a magical forest, and so that's why I've got a big smile on my face. I think if you can hug a tree figuratively, you get your arms around that trunk, it's gonna give you stability and it's gonna give you strength so that you can keep your feet on the ground, keep your feet out of the details, and make sure that you're taking a strategic approach to sustainability. So what are the strategies? First one, drop the comparison. So this is on top of reduce, reuse, recycle, all those things. Drop the comparison. I read this book once by a local Vancouver author named Robin Harding. She wrote this book called Mom, Will This, Ma Will this Chicken Give Me Man Boobs? And those of you who have kids are probably laughing even harder because basically it's her guilt-ridden struggle for how to green her family. And her son was asking her this because he learned about hormones in chicken. And she talks, I think one of the biggest themes in her book is she talks about how she's trying to green her family in this very green neighborhood called Kitsilano in Vancouver. And she talks about how her neighbor takes her children to cello lessons in the bike trailer, with the cello, in the bike trailer, in the rain. And she's like, I'm never going to be that great. You know, I'm driving my SUV and I'm so horrible. Drop the comparison. Think how much time she's spending on thinking about that. Use that energy somewhere else. The next one, do what you can in your context. The reality is we are trapped in the same system. We're all trapped in this system. I can't fix something, I can't, you know, I can do my thing to fix the plastic. Maybe you can do something else. Everyone has a different context they can work within. Maybe you have connections to the UN. Maybe you work on a government level. Maybe you're like Nico and you're doing amazing things in your community. Pick what you can do in your context and do it. And finally, vote with your wallet. In 2009, in August, when it hit the news that SIG, uh, the Swiss water bottle, SIG, they produced the SIG aluminum water bottles, it hit the news in August that they actually admitted that the lining on the inside of their aluminum um, bottles did contain biphenyl A, BPA, which is a hormone disruptor. The literal crap hit the fan. They had huge backlash from the media, and they're very loyal and dedicated uh, consumer brand equity was shaken to the core. And I think with the proliferation of social media tools like Facebook and Twitter, we all have an incredible tool at our disposal to be able to tell companies, hey, I don't like what you're doing. And the best thing you can do is if you've got a problem with somebody or something, don't buy their product. And talk about it in social media. That's what Twitter's for. Besides talking about, you know, people saying, oh, I've done this and I went there in that concert, you can tag companies and say, hey, Sig, I'm pissed. Or, hey, I really like your product. Keep giving us more. Use social media to your advantage, and if you don't like something, put your wallet back in your pocket and don't buy it, because that sends a very, very strong message to, cons to these companies as consumers. So the last thing I'd like to leave you with is one of my favorite quotes right now. It's from George Musser, um, from his article in The Climax of Humanity, called The Climax of Humanity. It says, if decision makers can get the framework right, the future of humanity will be secured by thousands of mundane decisions. It's usually in mundane matters that the most profound advances are made. So what I'd like to challenge you with and leave you with is, please keep your feet on the ground, pass all of your decisions through how you know we are being unsustainable, and 
make sure you do those little beautiful thousands of mundane decisions because we, the world, really, really need you. Thank you very much. <laughs>